Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll Station podcast, episode six. My name is Mickey Kravitz. Today's guest is not a name you may know, but I'm sure you've heard his work. Producer, songwriter, music publisher, drummer, and record producer, Phil Weinman. But first, the Rock and Roll Station podcast is sponsored by Mickey Allen Kravitz, MAC Hair Products, specializing in hair growth support shampoos and conditioner, eyelash and brow growth serum, and hair styling products, all available at Amazon or the website machair.com. That's M-A-K hair.com. In the late 60s and 70s, Phil Wayman worked with the Boomtown Rats, Yardbirds, Bay City Rollers, also worked with Mud, Generation X with Billy Idol, the sensational Alex Harvey Band, XTC, and today's topic, one of my all-time favorite bands, The Sweet. The Rock and Roll Station podcast welcomes the one and only Phil Wayman. And on the phone, Phil Wayman. Good morning or good afternoon. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And you? Um, great. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you, Your work has been a part of my life since I was like 10, actually. Now you're making me really feel old. <laughs> well, I was. this was a long, long time ago. <laughs> You've worked. I can barely remember it. Well, you've worked with some of the greatest musicians of all time, bands that have really left a mark in rock and roll history, from the Boomtown Rats, Yardbirds, Bay City Rollers, Generation X, and of course, one of my all-time favorite bands, The Sweet. Right. Yeah. I uh, I was there. I witnessed it. Yes. Now, before we get into The Sweet and everything. Can you describe what the, the music scene was like in London at that time? Um, it was great. Uh, I just had unbelievably good memories of that time. I mean, I was a musician myself, so I was touring and it, with Jimmy Cliff. I was Jimmy Cliff's drummer for a couple of years and uh, ended up in, um, um, in Sweden. And I heard, I was in Sweden for about a year, um, uh, and you know, I I, lo I got lots of um, studio experience there, and, and I, I heard what was going on in the UK, and that was kind of like my calling card. I heard the Kinks and the Who on Radio Luxembourg at the time, and and um, I decided that I was going to quit the band and come back and work in England. So, um, and I came back in the middle of the sixties, and it was. Um, really quite something. I was still a, a, a kind of a professional drummer and I joined a band called, um, they were called the Paramounts originally from South End in, in just outside London and they later became Proper Horror. Okay. So that's how it all started for me. I was really a studio musician um, that kind of learned to write a song here or two and then really got into the production side. Right. And then when back in that scene, okay, this is, I guess, before Bowie and T-Rex and the sweet, and yeah. the Beatles yeah. were, were the thing back then, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The, the Stones and the Beatles. And I was a big Beatle fan. By any chance, did you ever meet a Beatle? Uh, I was giving Ringo Starr drum lessons. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, to be honest with you, behind me, George Harrison, and John Lennon were chatting to my bass player, and I didn't really want to be speaking to uh, to Ringo, giving him lessons on what I did in which song. So I really, I kind of missed out on the real stuff. Wow. Well, that's something mm -hmm. to you know to have in your your past. Well, to be honest with you, I'd rather be chatting with the other two. Right. Right. <laughs> you know. But he was buying me a drink. I felt uh, obliged to, to, you know, to chat with him. Uh, and uh, no, no, he's a nice enough guy. But as far as I was concerned, he was just another drummer in a band that had made it. Right, right. Okay, so let's get to the suite. You, right. how did you meet them, or how did they come on your radar? Did had you seen them play before they contacted you, or? How did that all fall? You know, come together. Well, um, I had come off the road, and I was um, uh, writing jingles and doing uh, a little bit of production and writing songs. And I ended up in an office um, sharing a desk with a guy called Paul Nicholas, who became 
um, quite a big star in his own right. And he was the person that said, Phil, if you produce Sweet, uh, they weren't called Sweet then, by the way. They were called Sweet Shop. Right, right. Um, and um, I'll manage them. And that's how it went. I mean, I actually uh, recorded one title with them. Um, called Slow Motion and placed it with Fontana Records. And it was a flop. Um, then I, I lost them to um, uh, George Martin's company, um, Air London. And they had uh, three turntable hits with them. So they didn't, ha they couldn't crack swim. And then I uh, stumbled across um, uh, two, two writers. Um, Jim and Chapman. Right. Uh, and they brought me um, some songs, and I said, as it so happens, I think I know, uh, you know, I, I, I know a band that would be great um, to do this sort of material. And I was doing a session, um, you know, within a week or two of that meeting, and um, I was at the BBC uh, playing, again, I was with a, with a hit band, and behind me was um, Brian and Mick, and they said, well, you know, can you get us the song? Like, I was actually playing. My drum kit was set up, and they were actually sitting literally behind me playing. Huh. And they said, why don't you get us a song like that? I turned around, I was got a shock, you know, to see, you know, kind of like a couple of my old buddies just sat there, because they were in a, an adjacent studio. And um, I said, well, if it's so happened, I think I might have just the song for you. And that's how it happened. It happened by magic. Right. Very lucky. Now, let me ask you, when, when you did slow motion, um, yes. Frank was still in the band, correct, playing guitar? Yes, he was, yes. And when you guys went in, because, you know, the suite, were, they're kind of known for, uh, one of their trademarks is their harmonies. And everything when yeah. they were, you know, compared to Queen and you know all that stuff back in those sure. days. Yeah. Did yeah. they have that already, or is that something you guys developed together? Well, um, I think when when Andy joined the band, and this is quite some time later, Andy added the third dimension to their vocals because they they were vocally very confident anyway. I mean, they were, you know, I mean. Brian had a very, very distinctive voice. And um, I, I have to say that, that Mick, um, they, they all sang really well, but when Andy joined, it, it actually went to the next level. Uh, and that's when you got that real high, the high end there. Right. That was Andy. You know, Andy was, 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 was brilliant. Yeah, every I mean their harmonies. As are... was Steve. I mean Steve. You know, Steve was the go-to. If, if I had a problem, you know, vocally, um, say with Brian or anything like that, I'd always say, Steve, um, is this something that you know? Can you help us out here a bit? And he would just stand there and just do it. It, it was the second nature. He was like the standard, and that's how the double vocal thing came about because I would say to him, okay, well, we need a lunatic to say the next line. Right. Steve, Steve, step up. And I, I uh, and, and to be honest with you, so like, no, 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 it's not manic enough. You're not a lunatic. I mean, it wants to sound like a lunatic. And, and this is, this is, this is how those lines came about. I love all those lines that he would throw in because yeah. he would sound like a lunatic. Absolutely. I mean, that was the intention. And then, it, see, in those days, um, there were there were no rules because um, we made everything up as we went along. And, you know, you've got a fresh idea. Let's try this. And the echoes we would try. We would hear the spinning echo. And I'd say, well, I want to use that. How can I use that? I want to use that. And I would then end up using it on Steve or a track or something. I would end up using the spinning echoes, especially if they're in time. Right. So, you know, it, you, it, whatever you could imagine, you could almost do. But today, when you've got all those fantastic tools, you know, that you can do all this digital. Remember, we were analog. Right. And today you can do almost 
anything digitally. So, you know, at the press of a button, which makes it even more convenient. And uh, it's actually, for me, it's that, that technology is not being used like it w- would have been in, in my day. Right. Now, on, do, do, do you understand? What it, I'm oh, yeah, at? completely. Completely. I mean, yeah. I, I love recording analog. Uh, my first record I did on analog, and now everything is sure. Pro Tools. So, sure. Yeah. When yeah. you but did those. You've got Pro Tools, and you've got buttons you can press, and you've got boxes that you can record segments of songs on. But I was doing, I was making this up. Uh, um, you know, when you couldn't actually just press a button, I had to work with tape loop, um, right. uh, uh, you know, and believe it or not, Bye Bye Baby, which was the number one record, that was a tape loop. The, the actual chorus was such a tricky, intricate chorus that if we were making that record without cheating, then I reckon I'd still be making it to this very day. Right. So what we did is we got one chorus, and I, I knew that everything was in time because we worked to a click. In those days, we worked to a click. Um, and I know that I could spin the choruses out onto half-inch tape and then spin them in again, you know, where, where, where necessary. Huh. So that was basically the first um, use of Pro Tools in a way. <laughs> Well, it wasn't Pro Tools. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the same style, but using it on analog. Bigger. Right. Yeah, of course. We were, oh, I, I, I distinctly know that the, when we were sat there and everyone had two pencils, they had a pencil in each hand, and those pencils were the tape guides, and, the, you know, the control room had this huge loop going around it. That actually was the chorus. Huh. Now, when you all I had to do was press the button at the right time, correct. Wait for it to get up to speed, and then press record on the multi-track, and I had another chorus. Yeah, it's like... never been done before. In fact, I, the engineers that I work, was working with, with with at the time, said, "No, that can't be done." I said, "Of course it can be done. Work with me," and that's what we did. We created this loop, and they could not believe, you know, what was going on, and we were kind of all all sniggering, but to be honest with you, it was a, an experiment that paid off. Right. And that was for, you said, Bye Bye Baby for um, Bay City yeah. Rollers? Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you did those first singles with The Sweet, uh, yeah. everyone knows uh, they just basically came in and did the vocals. You you did the drums. Yeah. You played. You put yeah. recorded the drum tracks. Pip William did guitar. Uh, yeah. How did those, in the beginning, were they okay with that? Because I know they wanted to do the B sides. Sure. Well, funny, funny was the first single in the new regime, which was, you know, my production company with Nicky Chin, and um, we had already made the track to Funny Funny. So they, they, the demo that they heard, right? Mm-hmm. That they said, you know, the, the deal was. Remember, they were signed to another record company. They were signed to George Martin's record company, Air Records. Okay. Um, and. Um, so I couldn't officially record them. So I said to them, come in, put your voices on my back track, and I'll mix it up and see see how good it sounds. And that, that, was, that was the master. Wow. And the B-side, You're Not Wrong for Loving Me, Yeah, they did that. Yeah. So with... They played on, and they played on all their B-sides. The thing was, you know, we were a young company, we didn't have very much money, and every hour in the studio w- was, you know, like two, three, four hundred pounds. Wow. So the, 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 the trick was to get in there, bosh it down, <laughs> and put their voices on, mix it up. I, nothing took more than an hour, two hours, and, you know, within six um, hours of recording, we had a finished master. Wow, that's fast. So how fast yeah. were they when they would go in to do their own? Um, they were just as fast, because the deal was that if they didn't do it as fast, I would charge them the extra recording time. Hmm. So, of course, you know, I nearly had a mutiny, if you think about it. 
but there was a mutiny on my hands, and it was it was funny because they said, "Well, you know, if we're not going to play on our own records, but we're not going to turn up." So I said, "Okay, okay, I get it. I do get it. it you've got to be as good or better than the tracks I'm putting down." And they went, "Well, right, well, we'll show you." It was like, "We'll show you," and we routine stuff. And the first, I think, the first single they played on was "We Went Back." Okay. And um, they blew me away. <laughs> okay. And every session was like that. We'll show you. We'll show you how good we are. And, and I thought, well, you know, listen, I, I, if they come into the studio with that kind of mindset, then that's the band I want to be with. Right. Did. Um... You know, because I wound, I wound up, you know, and they wanted to show me how, how professional, how good they could be. And I, I, I held out both hands and said, well done, boy. You know, um, you've done it. Uh, and, um, hey, you know, I owe you money. <laughs> had you, had, were they playing live shows at that time as well? Yes. I mean, they were really good live. They were a good, a good little band. Do you know, they, they were like a, a Motown band. Okay. You know, they had all the harmonies off. They would do baby love. They would do. Uh, they, they, they would go through the whole repertoire of of, of, of Motown, they, and, and they get the whole place jumping. And um, they were really, really good at it. Really good. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, Mick Tucker has been one of my all-time favorite drummers uh, since. That was one of my all-time favorite drummers. Um, but you know, the the thing was when I first met them. Um, I had already made a drum record. Right. Know, because I, I liked Sandy Nelson and everything, and I did this singing drum record on EMI. And he said, I he said, I heard your drum record. I really like your drum record. So I had a bit of a head start when I when I walked in. But, you know, because Mick Tucker said, yeah, you know. Uh, and we didn't know that we were going to be making drum records later on in life, believe it or not, right. which we did. And, you know, of course, we used to talk drums a lot. And, you know, they, they, he liked the sound that I'd get from his kit. Um, that's kind of like a, a speciality of mine, if you like, is, is getting the drum right. Getting drums and bass. If you've got drums and bass right and they're playing the right thing, then you've kind of got a good record to start, to start with the engine room. Right, right. You're in the engine room, you, you know, if your foundation's solid, then everything that goes on top of that is going to be, it's going to be okay. Right. And when they did that wigwam bam, that was really considered, some say, the first glam single. Yeah. And they kind of went that direction. Yeah. Do you? Uh, all, all intentionally. Oh, was it? Yeah. You know because. That's the fashion was changing then, and you know that's when they started to put makeup on. And I thought, well, you know, rather than the me, and you know, Steve was well into it. Right, right. <laughs> and they, 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 they were all in it. It was kind of like, okay, boys, you know, or girls, whatever. Right. <laughs> you know. Whatever floats your boat, and do you know what? The fans were loving it, and then, you know, then you've got David Bowie, then you've got Mark Bowie, and you think, so, bloody hell, this is it. You know, this is, um, this is where it's at, you know, and um, Glam Rock was born. So do you think the suite, being there at that time, were considered the first, or? No, Mark, Mark Boland. Mark Boland. Without doubt, yeah. Actually, Mark was a, a, a good friend of mine, and um, he, um, he he was when I first met him. Um, he was called the Wizard, and he had some records out, and they had they hadn't happened. But he was into sort of um, weird stuff then. I mean, he used to walk around with a cloak and all sorts of stuff. And then you know he got into the glam thing, and then I think you know he had hits with the glam, and then. I think Bowie followed him, and we followed them. Right, right. So, so no, I don't think we were. I don't think we were the first, but we certainly did climb on the bandwagon. Did um, did the Sweet and uh, T Rex? Did they ever do any shows together? I'm sure. I'm sure they did. Yeah, 
That would have been an I'm amazing sure concert. I, I, don't, I can't give you dates, but everybody used to do dates together. We used to meet up at Top of the Pops, and we would actually scheme between the bands as to when records should be released so that we don't get in each other's way. He'd say, well, okay, when's a good time for you? Well, we're going to go first week, um, straight after Christmas. January was our favourite spot. And, of course, you know, then you'd have other bands, you'd have the Osmonds to contend with, you'd have Slade to right. contend with, you had in those days Gary Glitter to, 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 to contend with, and then uh, there was there was Barry, uh, there was Mark, uh, T-Rex. So, right. you know, we would kind of, if you like, say, you know, leave that space for us. And, you know, we won't get in your way. What was it like working with Chin and Chapman? Um, tricky. Tricky? Tricky, yeah. Um, I can't say it was a pleasure. Um, but, you know, listen, they were writing the songs. And um, uh, we worked together. Did we enjoy it? No, I, I, you know, I, I didn't enjoy working with them. I, I had all sorts of behind the scenes uh, ups and downs with them, but not with the band. But the band had their own ups and downs, and they they didn't realise that what was going on <laughs> behind the scenes right. was probably worse than the, what they were dealing with. So you know, both camps had problems. When you would uh, go in and record um, them on their B sides. Did you, you know what was? Do you have any secrets, any recording techniques that you would use just for them, or did Brian double? No, did I, he double I, I lead vocals or anything? It was a chance for the band to run loose, and I didn't want to get in the way of that. So I would listen to the song and say, "Yes, okay, that's that's cool." Um, I do you realise how close it is to anything Deep Purple has done, and because they were big fans of Deep Purple and friends of Deep Purple. Right, right. And it was like it was like the dark the darker side of um, of sweet. And and um, you know, it, and that's what that's what they wanted to do and I wasn't going to get in the way of that. In fact, I was encouraging it because eventually um, I did Sweet FA with them and that's when they really um, you know, could um, could cut loose because so they were always reliant upon Chin and Chapman's songs. And I said to them, you know, you've got to do, you've got to write your own. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, it, it got so bad with Chin and Chapman that I actually um, decided to, um, well, I didn't decide, I actually got fired. But they, 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 um, they decided to go with Chin and Chapman and record in America. And they did... Um, they did a, a half an album and a single, um, and it, it was a bit of a disaster, really, um, because um, I'm just trying to think of the song. When was that? Well, you know, about what year? Um, it would be late '70s, because it was. I it, the thing was they were signed to my production company, and you know uh, they were actually signed. To to to, um, to New Dawn Productions for three years and then Chimebridge for another six years. So there were, and we had to we had to um, uh, we had to hit targets. So the first three years we said, look, you know, if we don't earn you a million pounds, then you're free to walk. And um, we did a, we did better than that. Um, and and the same with the next contractual term. If we we you know if we said if we don't earn you five million pounds, then you know you're free to walk. And we did double that. So you know it's kind of that sort of thing went on, and we were hitting these targets. Uh, but they decided that they wanted to work. They were too frightened to come with me, um, and they were very reliant on 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 actually Mike Chapman. Uh, they felt that if they they left him, then they wouldn't have any hits on their own. What was um, the last actually, song? They, they, yeah, they had... Um, um, was Ballroom Blitz one of the last them. ones you worked with? Worked on with? Um, it was, yeah, well, it, no, it was Teenage Rampage, and I think it was a, a couple of others that I did. Okay. But Ballroom Blitz was... was 
was the drum record that I didn't make myself. And um, I heard the song, and the boy said to me, what do you make of this? And I knew exactly what to make of it, because the demo was nothing like the single. Okay. Uh, Mike Chapman used to do demos. And, I, and at the time, I had all these ideas, because I wanted to make another drum record, and all these ideas that I... I had, I thought, do I, do I hit them with every idea I've got? Or do I just keep these for, for my own, for, do my own thing? And I thought, do you know something? I'm going to share it with the boys. And I sat behind mix kit and I said, this is how it's going to go. And honestly, their faces were a picture, were an absolute picture. Because they got, they actually got it straight away, uh, and we routined the track one day, then we routined all the voices the next day, and then we put them all together the next day. So you, we were extremely well rehearsed. And then the boys were saying, "We want to go into the studio tomorrow." I said, "Well, tomorrow's Saturday. Can't we go? Can't we go tomorrow?" I said, "No, no, no. We're not booked for Saturday. We're actually booked for Monday." No, 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 we want to, we want to, we want to do it now. Because they, and I said, look, you know, I'll see you on Monday, enjoy your weekend. And boy, did they do it on Monday. They came in and absolutely blew us away. They, they were terrific. Absolutely terrific. That's a great song. Actually, yeah, well, the thing is, all the ideas, you know, they were all rehearsed. So, you know, the the, the drum breaks there, but this guitar build-up, whatever we were doing, it was all rehearsed. So when we went into the studio, we we just done, the band just played. And, and I think the track was down. The track would have been down within an hour and a half. Absolutely right. The only thing that I didn't like, um, mix uh, snare drum sounded terrible. I said, I'll go and get my own. So I got my, my, I had my drum kit in the back of my car, and I took the snare drum out and I said, "Try this." And he went, "Okay, this is great." And as as the session went on, the drum sound got better and better, and you know, um, yeah, it became it became a drum record. Yeah, definitely. I, I want to go back real quick because I forgot to mention this. The first time I heard the suite was Little yeah. Willie. Yes, and you did. Well, that was number two in America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the first time I ever heard him, and it kind of really got me into music as a little kid. I was like, wow. "Oh, I kind of like this," you know. Um, okay. When you guys did that, you did the drums on that, correct? I was playing on that. Yeah. What a great song! I mean, when they did that, they were like, "Wow, maybe we made it in America." Yeah, you know, maybe we made it in America, but when we came with um, the, the next single with the siren, um, which would have been Blockbuster, right? Uh, the American record company said we can't issue it with the siren, so we had to take the siren off. Why? Because it because it would have stopped traffic. <laughs> and it would have created chaos. You're kidding where, me. You know, sorry? Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. And, of course, uh, you know, it wasn't a bigger hit there. I can't, I, the thing was with Sweet, you know, in England, if you didn't do something spectacular in the first 30 seconds, the BBC would, wouldn't play it. So... When they played me uh, that song, I kind of knew what I wanted to do with it. And Pip, I was doing sessions with Pip, and he would be frigging around with this bloody siren in the middle of sessions. He said, I've got this new toy, Phil. What do you think? And I said, well, can I borrow it? And he said, sure. And that's when the boys were playing on their own records, and that was... Pip's siren. And when, of course, when I turned up with it, they all thought it was bonkers. And that actually made the record. So every time we made a sweet record, so what are we going to do at the beginning of this one then, Phil? And I 
<laughs> oh, right. Some some bullshit that, that you know that would kind of work. Right. Oh yeah, we're going to run with that. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's do it. <laughs> did you did you guys ever do any uh, some of those singles where they would come in and do the vocals so only? And it just wasn't there, and you scrapped it. Was there any of those songs left laying around? No, no, we never did that. We would always agree on stuff. I mean, Chin and Chapman would play me some songs, and I'd say, you know, no to this, no to that, um, and yes, can you finish that because it's unfinished? And they say, well, what do you mean it's unfinished? They were, well, you know, a it needs a little bit of a break in here, and it needs something there. And I would kind of tell. Um, Mike Chapman, what I needed it to do, and he would kind of re- he would rewrite and um, and bring it back, and I said, I, I think I think, you, I think you cracked it, and that was it. And the boys, you know, and, and then I'd say, this is this is our next single, you know, what what do you think? Uh, and that's how that's how they heard the songs. They heard kind of finished demos, and then we would go and routine in some church or in um, Ealing, and um, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday we'd be in the studio, Tuesday we would be um, mixing, Wednesday we would be mastering. It, it happened so quickly. My God, that is so we fast. Were a, we were a machine. We were an absolute machine. What were you recording on back then? Was it, uh, were you using 16 track? Um, the early stuff was 16 track and then it changed, you know, yes, to 24. 24. Um, so with yeah. how many vocal tracks were they using? I'm just kind of curious if um, some of those were doubled or. Vocals. Yeah, back out vocals, uh, we would tri- triple track and then mix those three tracks down to, to a pair so that they were a stereo pair. I wish I could have been there to watch and listen to them in the studio, especially Mick Tucker. I wish I could have been there to watch him. Yeah. Are you a drummer? No, no, no. Well, I started out as a drummer. And it's so funny right, because okay. I got to meet Mick in 90 when Andy and uh, Mick came here. I went right. to all the shows they played here in Los Angeles. I think there was five or four or five of them. I went to all of them. And they signed. Right. They were so cool. They signed everything. And you better believe me. I mean, yeah. collecting for years, I had like a stack, 30-something records for them to sign. And they signed them all. Right. So when I yeah. first met but, Mick... You know, yeah, when I first met Mick, he goes, you're a drummer, because I told him I was a big fan. I said, no, I'm a singer, but I started out as a drummer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no he, he's, uh, he was lovely. He was really lovely. And we we always had this kind of bond, because, you know, I kind of knew what he was thinking, and he knew what I was thinking. It was kind of like, you know, and he would actually call me. You know, and we would have a discussion like for maybe two hours, you know, and he would recap all the sessions. Do you know, so when you did this and you said we, we, we should be doing this and, and we changed it to that, and he would talk me through all the old history. Wow. All the tracks that we, he remember everything, you know, and we, we never, we never fell out. Now, Andy and I fell out. Oh, really? um, but never, n- never with Steve, never with Brian. But Andy, yeah, because Andy was like the new boy, and um, Andy was c- can be a difficult cut when he wants to be. But you know something? We had a little private chat, um, and you know, we both had it out, and you know, yeah, and we're 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 good mates. I mean, you know. We've been mates now for many, many years. So, um, yeah. But, yeah, we we had it out. And we had it out in a little room just to service. And, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you stay in, how things got. Did, have you stayed in contact with him now recently? Sure. Absolutely, yeah. And sure. did, with I everybody mean, else as well until, you know, I mean, you know, we lost Brian. I, I was in touch with most of the boys and, uh, and then unfortunately I was, I went to all the funerals as well. So, you know, um, uh, I was kind of like in touch with Brian and, 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 and I mean, Mick's life was, wasn't a particularly good one. You know, he had, he had problems at home and, and it affected him and you know, they, 
I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, you think to yourself, if these guys were were never stars, would they still be alive? Have I have I shortened their lives, or have I in, encouraged them um, to go off, to go off the rails? Have I um, have I given them given them a better life than they would have had if they were working, you know, with the telephone company? Because that's where Brian was. I mean, you know, you, you, you ask these questions. I ask myself these questions. Do you, you know, you know, did I did I give them a life that they enjoyed, or was it a struggle for them? Because you know, I've worked with a lot of actors, and I watched how they deal with success and how they deal with their successfulness with with money and how they spend it and what they do with it, and you know, and you know. I, I come from very, very humble beginnings, and I'm still around, but I never got involved with the drugs, and I never got involved with the drink, right. you know, um, and, um, and I'm still reasonably compassmentous, where lots of the guys today does, have lost it. Right. Have you seen Andy's uh, band, his version of Sweet Live lately? No, I haven't seen them live at all. Um, I he sends me, in fact, Kevin sends me, you know, the videos of the, you know, what they are, you know, the, the new single and what they're up to, and then, you know, we were due to get together last time I was down in Dorset because I've got um, a holiday home in Dorset, and they said, oh, we'll come over and we'll meet you, and you know, uh, we can, you know, hang out together because they're not uh, not that far from there. So I said, absolutely fine. And that was arranged for last time I was down, but Andy got sick, uh, and um, he he wore himself out um, on tour in Germany, and I think he's been in and out of hospital. So, you know, he's taking it easy at the moment. Right. But, you know, he's, he's the last member, you know. And yeah. We had long a long chat, you know, should he, you know, should he quit? And I said, well, Andy, what are you going to do with yourself, you know? Um, what sort of life are you going to have? So I think he's 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 still he's still playing. I want to tell you this version of the band is one of the best I've seen him have in quite a while. The singer is amazing. Really? Yeah, I, I just right. by, from videos that I've seen. Sure. I, I, do you know the only thing I'd question because everyone is competent musically um, and you know vocally. I would question the material. Yeah, um, I had a I had a path planned for Sweet that never materialised, and I told Andy this. I said, "Look, you know, if you'd have stayed with me, if you would have actually gone in a new, a different musical direction." And he said, "Okay, so what musical direction would you have led led me on?" So I said, "Well, look, you know, um, I think that um, uh, you know the." Uh, um, the, there's a couple of directions, and one is a kind of a bluesier um, direction. Um, you know, uh, to um, because I wanted Steve to become um, the the centerpiece of the band. When when obviously when Brian died, then it was the three piece, and I thought um, you know it would be brilliant if they kind of became a contemporary um, cream in that kind of bluesy, rocky way. That would have been so amazing, it, actually. Wouldn't it have been? And, you know, I wanted to sit down and write songs with them because I believe that, you know, if we could have come up... Because I think that um, musically, there was no question about their um, their ability. Right. Um and, you know, to have come up with something in that direction, you know, um, I, I actually think they would have become a stadium band. You're actually and correct. I think so, sorry? too. When I think about yeah, that. Well, that's what Andy said. Andy said, you're right. You're right. That's the direction. And that's the direction we should have followed because um, they could have been huge. But... They decided to go their way, and they wanted to go with... They didn't want to risk anything, so they went with Mike Chapman. And, of course, that that's when it gave me my freedom to work with all the other acts. Right. So, you know, 
I wasn't without a gig for sure. But you're correct. I never thought about that. I ah. because now when you think about it, they always wanted to be heavier and a little more raw. Yeah. In the beginning. And but not rock, more blues. Yes, right. And you know, Steve was the which Steve was the guy to lead that. Steve had the voice for that. Steve yeah. could play bass for that. Andy would have followed Sue, and Mick would have loved it. It would have all, it would have worked. You know, he said, come my way, and this is what I'm going to do with you. This is the new direction. I planned, I can see it. I, because, I don't know, being a producer, and my role was having a crystal ball. I still use that crystal ball to this very day, and it, it's pretty clear. So I use, and I say this figuratively, because I I don't have a crystal ball, but that's my mindset. My mindset is to see where where their future, where my future is. And this this is the path that we need to actually take, this particular path, because I know, I know this is gonna work. I sure wish they they would have done that. I oh, <laughs> it would have been a very, very. It would been very, very different. They would have been a stadium band. Whether Steve would have stayed on board, whether Steve, you know, could have kept himself together, you know, right. Mick was. We didn't know Mick was that ill, you know. He, you know, so, you know, you think to yourself, you know, would they have survived? Maybe not. Maybe not. But they would have been. Bigger stars, right? Been bigger stars because, you know, unfortunately, you know, with Brian, Brian, you know, was he? He, he had a, 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 I don't know if it's public knowledge, but he had a drink problem. Oh yeah, Every, um, yeah, everybody knows yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so you know, and uh, when they told him to stop drinking, you know, that it could actually cost, he, he will die. He and he, he actually he hit the bottle even harder. And um, and he was a lovely soul. He was a lovely soul. This, this, he was a man that, do you know something? He was the guy that you would actually want to interview. He was the person that would front the band and say all the right things. And, you know, you would have a good interview. There would be a good article. And everything would have been great. You couldn't say that with the <laughs> Three. Well, unfortunately, he's because the you only. Know what you wouldn't know what you were going to get. <laughs> well, he's the only one that I never had the chance to meet. Oh, well, he was the special one. You know, he was the kind of like, he would do the photos, say the right things. He would, you know, be there on time. He was, he was the man. The other three you'd chance your arm on because, you know, <laughs> especially Steve. You didn't know what you were going to get. I yeah, I met Steve here. He was uh, doing his version of the suite, and uh, a yep. friend of mine was playing drums for him at, and they were rehearsing. I was actually at the very first rehearsal that because wow. they live right behind me, and yep. um, he told me so. I went down, and he was a character. I mean, yeah, he had stories just one right after another. Just yeah. had me laughing my okay. ass off. Yeah, sure. You yeah, but you know, if you caught him on a bad day, right? Oh, maybe. You know, yeah. He, he, yeah, yeah. But you never got that with Steve. Steve was so with uh, Brian. He was really, you know, one of the regular guys. And you could say, okay, ten o'clock tomorrow morning, you're at uh, you know enemy, and they want to interview you. Yeah, don't worry, I'll be there. He was there, <laughs> you know, and he would always say the right stuff. Where the other guys, you, you didn't know what what they would say, who they would slag off, you know. You, right. Yeah. I so, was you know. I was such a sweet fan that I'll tell you this real quick story. Um, um, here in L.A., the band. Are you familiar with the band Great White? Um, no. Okay. Well, they, they were an '80s band, and they were signed to Capitol. And I got invited to their record listening party at the China Club here in Hollywood. And all I knew, they're on Capitol. So I'm standing at the bar, 
And this, there's a couple girls. I'm talking to a couple girls, and she goes, oh, I work at Capital. First thing out of my mouth is, do you know the guys in suite? <laughs> and it happened to be Maureen, Steve's wife. Oh, wow. So, oh. I, yeah, I, I met her before I met anybody else. Right. Well, she went on to do PR for uh, Michael Jackson, didn't she? I don't know if she did for Mike. Maybe, but I know the, I the agency. Yeah. I, I have another friend of mine. Her. She was she was quite big time. Yeah, very big. A friend of mine worked for her for a while. I don't know. She may still work yeah. there. Let me ask you this. I don't want to know your finances or anything, but yeah. are you still getting royalties from those singles in the suite? Yeah, um, not like I used to. Um, I, I, I've cancelled my private jet. And <laughs> 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 uh, I'm traveling, you know, I, I still travel um, uh, mid class. So, you know, I'm. Um, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> That's, you know, from but the if 70s. I had to rely now, yeah, if I had to rely now on my royalties from my records, um, I wouldn't be living the life that I, I live now. So, you know, and in fact, you know, record companies will not pay you unless you sue them. Right, right. They don't want to get that I, money. I, I, found that, I found that a lot. I found that a lot. Not with Sweet, because Sweet, uh, the tapes are, are mine. Those copyrights and those tapes are mine. Um, uh, so we we kind of control we control that. Right. But every other act that I've been involved with, um, you actually have to sue the record company. Um, and what they do is they hope that you haven't got enough money to. Right. Exactly. That's what they hope. Yeah. So you know that's that's un that's the unfortunate part of, of the business we're in. Are you doing any production now? No. No. Um, you know, I, I, I listen to the radio a lot. I still buy records um, of, of, of artists, or new artists, and think, oh, my, what a, what a lovely, or a great song. Or a record you wish you made, you know, you hear something, you think, oh, that's brilliant. Right. I've got to own that. I've got to, I've got to play that. And I, I want to be able to play it whenever I want to play it. So, yes, I, I, I'm a fan of, 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 um, of other people's. Um, do, have I still got it? I don't think so. Uh, I, I kind of leave it to the youngsters. My hearing is still pretty damn good after all these years. And after playing live and then being in the studio for years and years and years, my hearing is still, you know, still pretty damn good where I've got lots of friends that, you know, have to learn to lip read, really. Are you still playing drums? Uh, I, my grandson plays the drums. So um, he's 10. And he is better than I was when I was 10. Oh, wow. So, um, and, but will he do it for a living? I don't think he's going to get the chance. I don't think his parents will let him give him that kind of freedom. I think they want him to have, you know, I didn't have a, a proper education. Um, I, you know, I left school when I was 15. So, um, you guys in America are still in education when you're in your 20s. It for, so, yeah. I, I was, yeah, I, you know, and uh, so you've got loads of time. I could not wait to get out of school. I just wanted the freedom. Right. So, you know, um, whether he gets a shot at, at, at it, whether he's going to cut the mustard when he's old enough, um, you know, personally, I, I think he'd make a brilliant actor. Um, you know, but again, will his parents, that's my daughter's son, will she um, give him the freedom to do, you know, to do what he'd like? Um, you know, that's, that's, it, it's his life and, and, and they're responsible for it. And I, I don't want to be accused of leading him straight. Right. I, to be honest with you, I don't actually think you can do what I did um, today. No, the world's changed a lot. Sure. Yeah. Brian's well, son. You know, are you are you in touch with Brian's son? Brian? No. He's no. actually singing pretty good. He's doing a lot of shows and stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. You can just find him at Brian Connolly Jr. Uh, on Facebook. Oh, is he Brian Connolly Jr.? Yeah. Right. Okay. 
Because when I met Brian for the first time, you know, his name wasn't Brian Connolly. No, yeah, what was it? I forgot. Um, it was Brian McManus. Yeah, that's right. Oh, because, yes, he went to his parents and adopted and all that, correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely right. So, you know, um, and when I when I re-signed him, he, he signed another name. And I said, Brian, this is this is not your name. He said, No, this is this is my name. This is my name now. Oh, so, it was quite funny. It was quite funny. Yeah, because I was I always knew him as Brian McManus, and he is the brother of the actor that played the part of Taggart in that's um, correct. And in English, that's right. So, uh, and I didn't know that until later, and, and I don't think Brian did until later that that was his uh, that was his brother. Because they weren't brought up together. Right, right. He found out later at some point, like right. in his twenties or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, "Guess who my brother is?" I could, I had no idea. But how brilliant is that? I just wonder if they, if they spend time together. I've seen uh, his son Brian do. He's covered a couple of sweet songs, and he plays on. Uh, he does some um, uh, the uh, cruise ships and stuff. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there aren't any gigs anymore. You know, you've got, you know, everyone that makes it plays Wembley. You know, everyone who makes it plays all the big, big right. places. But then there's nowhere to pay your dues. There's no pubs that put on regular gigs where you can go in there and play. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, um, so, you know, live music and the little band that played and sing Wembley and da, 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 became high numbers who later became the who and, you know, all these sort of things. Those, those were the sixties and, and, and maybe half of the seventies. And that's when, you know, London, London was buzzing. And not only London, there were places like Glasgow and Birmingham and they all had their local bands and, you, and these, and these bands, Made it huge, right? Huge. And you, well, this is, you know, listen to this band. And you think, oh my word! And they, they're brilliant. Well, you know, band out of Birmingham, you know, suddenly become world world stars. Don't do singles, only albums. Right. And they're called Led Zeppelin. And you, think, well, okay. They've got a drummer out of Birmingham. They've got a session bass player. Um, John Paul Jones, and they've got, what's his name, guitaring, and, you know, you think, oh, my word, but they're fantastic. <laughs> you know, don't get blown away by bands. Exactly. No, no, has no. It all been, has it all been done? I don't know the answer to that. You know, whatever you do, you know, I had this idea. We've got something in, 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 in England, in fact, in Europe, called the Eurovision. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It has like four or five hundred million viewers. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we put a little pop band together, right, of like 17, 18 year olds and wrote a really cute song. Not, not cute, but a really clever song. You know, that was a real throwback to the 60s. How would that, how would that survive? Try it. And you think, well, because it would actually set a new would turn another page for 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 the, the Eurovision because the Eurovision has become a very sort of gay kind of thing. You know, it's, you know, every act that comes on is you know, um, you know, uh, you know a, 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 a lady with a beard and a yeah. A, it's, a, it's a it's it's a little bit of a freak show, right? And the audience are just as bad. And the and the audience flocked to it. I mean, you know, Liverpool was full of you know, okay, well that's that's fine. And I just thought, wouldn't it be great if you put on, you know, like a young band like the Who or the Kinks, and you just t turn the clock back and you see these little, you know, these young guys that you know that can write and that they can really play and they can sing great. Uh, but they play their own instruments, and they are a complete throwback, like the small faces. Yeah. Marriott, 
Yeah. Can you oh. imagine a band like that doing <laughs> Eurovision? I, you know. I would like to hear another Steve Marriott. Yeah, I would love to hear another Steve Marriott. How about that? You know, that's what I would. But, you know, when I did some digging around, it was all um, uh, handled by a um, by a, a, a management company that managed the last, not last year, the year before, the Rocket Man or whatever he, you know, he did, um, some sort of song. Um, but it was all managed by, by this um this management company, and everything had to go through them. And I thought, well, we stand absolutely no chance of ever, of ever coming up with anything that's going to be of, of the standard that they would expect for Eurovision. And this had nothing to do with Eurovision. So I was going to take Eurovision in a complete, on a completely new journey right. with a throwback, you know, um, and it wouldn't have stood a chance. It would have been a total waste of time. So um, I've got a song set around now that that, um, <laughs> that never got recorded. You need which to is, find a band, a new band, and work with them uh, again. Uh, well, you know, I, I think I'd be wasting their time, and I think I might be wasting mine. Because, although I would love it because, you know, I still got music in my blood. I don't. I think it would be tough getting through a record company door. Right. I, I genuinely do. I mean, you know, it, you know how tough it is in America to try and even get an appointment to get even somebody to listen to something. Oh it's yeah. It's impossible. Right. It's impossible. I, you know. And I think it's become like that here now. I think that, you know, and to be honest with you, um, I think they've all got, I think they've all got cloth ears anyway. I don't think they know what public want. The, the, the music that is made today has become so, so fragmented that nothing really sells like it used to. So, you know, if you, if you sell, I don't know, maybe 10,000 records, in the UK, you've got a huge hit on your hand. Now, I used to do 75,000 a day. Right. And, and, and if they do 10,000, you know, um, with, with one single, it's considered a smash. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the major I, I, problems I, I, is that nobody has a distinct sound anymore. I mean, I'll listen to the radio, and I won't know... The same drummer could have played on all the the past ten songs that I just heard because it's all the same sound. The guitar player, it's all the same sound. I, I just well, think, I think with a drummer, it's, it's it's more likely to be a machine than it is a player. Right or triggers, right? Yeah, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, look, I actually saw that coming, um, maybe even before Stevie Wonder, because I had a, a drum a drum box. And in fact, it was a drum box that um, I, I use. I don't know if you've heard of Alex Harvey. Uh, yeah, of course. That... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I did an album with Alex called Next. And um, it's actually probably probably the best album I made. And working with a band like Alex um, was, was an absolute pleasure. We're gonna, because I didn't, have, I didn't have Chin and Chapman to deal with. Um, I just had a band in a studio from Scotland that could play really, really well. And with their material was kind of like, you think, as well, okay, this is kind of like on the edge of madness. And because, you know, uh, Alex used to write some really, really off-the-wall songs. And... I think they loved working with me because I was as off the wall as as they were, and we that that is a magical album for me even today. Um, you know, there's the, 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 there's a song on there called the Faith Healer, and you know that and uh, and Ballroom Blitz and maybe Mondays are the, are are, are they kind of like the three singles of my career. They, they are the ones that I think, you know, hang on a minute, they, that, those are pretty good. They're pretty good. Um, Anybody would wish know, for just one of those in their career, one of those three well, songs yeah, you, you just you mentioned. Know, but, 
sure. But you know, when you when you look out there and you look at the Beatles catalog and you think, oh my word, there's. I mean, you've got Eleanor Rigby and you've got um, just all their songs. You think, sort of, I just wish I was in the room, right, while they were recording it, because even I would have been happy to sweep the room listening to the playbacks just to be there just to be part of it right I mean, it, you know i sometimes dream that I, I i i i was the drummer in the Beatles, or I, I was working with mccartney last night and i was working with john lennon last night and how can you step into a room and impress these people because that's what you do. You know, you know they they expect you to be good and they expect you um to uh Take them to a new place. They expect you um, to teach them new tricks. Uh, am I right or am I wrong? Right. Uh, and these are these are the dreams that I have on a regular basis because you know you think to yourself, if I worked with him, where would I go with him? What would I do? You know, if I was working with McCartney, you know, I mean, I'm in awe of McCartney because of his writing ability. But then, how would I? How would I make a huge contribution? Because that's what they expect. And it, it's the same as when I was a session drummer. You know, I could go in there and I could play the drums for people and I would fit in or I wouldn't fit in or I would say something and I could actually make a proper contribution. And that's when, you know, producers would say to me, Phil, that was brilliant what you suggested. You know, it was, uh, you know, you should think about production. And, and that, that's how it started for me, because I would kind of like throw in my two pennies worth, and, uh, and uh, nine times out of ten, they would use it. Right. I, I, you know, they would play me a song, and I'd say, do you know what? I think you've written a hit song. And, of course, the writers would go, oh, wow, really? I said, but don't do, I, I think we're murdering it. <laughs> hmm. And they would say, okay. So we, I said, well, singer struggling. Um, because I think it's too, because I'd like to listen to the words. I'd like to, I didn't want to get in the way. As a drummer, you can play and you can play what's written or you can play the song. Right. And I was never a drummer to play what was written. I would always play the song. I'd play not to be in the way. I'd play to actually either be a little bit ahead of the beat, on the beat, very, very, very slightly behind the beat. Right. So you actually, you know when you feel something. And then I'd say that we're playing it at the wrong tempo. And I and I believe that the lyrically, it, the, the, the singer will it, it express himself better if we played it at this tempo. And if we simplified this and we simplified that, then the song will come to life. But at the moment, we're all over playing and they go, okay, they go in there and see what you, see what you can do. And they go in there, and I'd have a little chat with the boys, and then, and then, and 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 the next thing we play it, and they would actually say, oh, you know, it sounds brilliant. We just, we just, we just love, we just love what you've done. And I, I wouldn't get paid extra for that, but I'd get the credit for it. People would say, you know, if you used Phil, then, you know, he would tell you when you're going right and when you're going wrong. And right. I'd also, all the musicians, you know, say, look, you know, maybe pedal one note right through this, right through the whole of this part. Give me the note that's going to go right the way through because, you know, I'm sure that they'll pick that out. Right. And you think, you're so, okay, and it's, and it's not clashing with anything. And you think, oh, my word, it's kind of like a little thing that's there that you don't kind of, you don't hear until it's pointed out. But it would be dead without it. Well, I can honestly say you did an amazing job with all these songs because I've still listened to them to this day. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. Um, and, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that, you know, the work and, and the time and the toil and the trouble and everything that you go through, when you actually pull those faders back, that, you know, you're appreciated. I mean, when I pulled the faders back on... Um, uh, on Bullring Blitz, the hairs on the back of my neck were stood up. 
And I thought, oh, my word, what have I just done? Right, right. But see, like, you know, you think to yourself, and, and we, uh, you know, I can still feel it now that I thought, you know, we, we've actually, we've, we've, we've got a snapshot of this three, four minute song and the boys have actually nailed it. And I think the production's nailed it too. And I don't think we've missed, I don't think we've missed the trick. And I listened to that record today and I think, you know, still sounds pretty damn good. But I listen to other records that I made. You think, oh, I could have done that better. I could have mixed that. He, that, that should have been a bit louder. You know, you right, right. You, you, you. It's a painting that you know you feel that is kind of like not finished yet, or could be better, or you know. But when you hear that, that you think, you know, if you're going to go off and remake that, good luck because I don't think because the boys did go off and right. did go, did go and re-record these songs. For some dodgy label, um, uh, and because um, when they were out of copyright or something, they were allowed to re- go off and record them or re-record them. They were never the same, right? Because every record has to have that magic. Yep. You know, and if you haven't got that magic there, then you know it, it can. You know, it, it sounds it sounds flat. I must tell you one good story. I, I was working with the uh, with Boom Chair Raps and we recorded uh, Mondays. And um, my version was like the third version. There, there was two other producers that, that did it. Matt Langer, I think, did one. Gus Dudgeon um, uh, uh, did the version. And then um, they came to me. Um, Nigel Grange ran the record company and, and, and I had worked with him before on um, uh, Alex Harvey. And he said, Phil, we we need we need we need to produce the Boomtown Rats. Now, I had already passed twice on the Boomtown Rats and told him that, you know, I just I don't know, I just didn't see it. But then they had they had a number one with Rat Trap. Okay. And I thought, okay. And the phone rang and who is it? Nigel on the phone. Yes, Nigel, how can I help you? Look, Boomtown Rats, right? Um, we've got we've got a song. And um, we've, we've got two versions, and it's not happening for me. Okay. And um, we want to give you a shot. Would you meet with Bob Geldof and just talk through? We're going to send you the track. We're going to send you not their version. I don't want to hear any versions that anyone's produced. Give me the demo. So they sent me over the demo, and I could listen to the demo. Right, yeah, I've got it. Okay, and and then we want you to meet up with uh, with uh, with Bob in um, such and such a pub around the corner. We'll, we'll, I'll introduce you to him, and you can go off and have a drink together. So that's what we did. Got together, we're talking, and then he wants to know all about the basic the rollers, and then now, and then we start getting to talk about the track. And um, he says, "So, what do you think?" So I said, "Look, do you know what a big risk this is?" And they said, yes. He said, there's no risk. I said, well, I just, it's your career and it's my career. <laughs> if this thing falls on its, on its ass, then, then we're, we're both finished. Said, no, 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 it's going it's to, you know, if you make the right record, then you, it's going to be fine. So I said, okay, let me tell you where I want to go with it. And he said, okay. Um, are you still there? Yeah. Right. Um, he said, um, I said to him, if I made you a three, four minute Alfred Hitchcock record, do you get where I'm coming from? And he said, absolutely. And I said, well, that's what you're going to get. And there was no more, there was nothing more said. So we went to the studio and originally it was a lot longer. It was like, nearly five minutes long. So I had to cut okay. big lumps out of it and um, made this record. And I, um, I started off with um, piano um, and voice. It was just, just, just piano and voice. That was it. And I built everything up around it. Um, and it started to sound really very, very good. Now, 
We got as far as we could when my engineer decided he would up and go and go to Canada to work with Roger Whittaker on an album. So I'm kind of left with no engineer, only a junior engineer that was tape hopping for, for the session. So I said to Andy, okay, Andy, the record company are going mad. They want this, they want this next week and we've got to finish it. So how do you see mixing it with me? So he went white because he's a junior engineer. Right. So we went, we went the next day and we, 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 we mixed it. And do you know something? It sounded pretty damn good because it's actually right. If it's to write on tape, it's not that difficult to mix. Because if it's not right on tape, and you've got to start playing around with stuff right. to try and, you know. Anyway, it was it was right on tape. So all we had to do was to get the balances right and everything in the right place and then do these huge edits, So which we did. We sent it off to the record company, and they said, yes, we love it. We're going to put it out, da, 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 da. But I took it home and I listened to it. I thought, you know, there's something seriously missing. And I don't, I haven't worked it out yet what's missing. But it, it feels, it feels a bit dead. It's got, it's got like lead boot. It wasn't, it wasn't jumping out of the speakers. Right. So, and I thought, well, okay, I'll go back and I'll remix it and I'll, I'll come up with something. And I thought, you know what? Even if I took it back to the studio, would I change anything? And the answer was no, everything's right. But it just, it just wasn't, I don't know, it just wasn't cutting it. So the record company are on, well, well, what's happening? When are you, when are you going to deliver it? So I took it into the cutting room and um, I, I, I've got a, my, I had a studio complex. So I had studio one, studio two, of a mixing room and a cutting room and an editing room. So Utopia Studios had everything going for it. So I went into the cutting room and I said to the engineer, I said, Ian, um, have you ever put echo on a master while you're cutting it? And he said, never. I said, okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> and, he, and then I told him exactly what I wanted. I, I, what part of the echo I wanted. I only wanted the, the actual echo itself to come back. And I want to actually um, turn it, I want it to be, um, to come back as in, in 4K. And I want it to, to kind of be like, like a magic dust. <laughs> okay. It's the only way I could explain it. And he thought, yeah, yeah, right, okay. So I said, can you plug it up? He said, yes. I said, can you use, uh, I wanted Echo Plate 2, which was the Echo Plate that kind of like, that's the, the magic Echo Plate. Um, and we had we had four in there, and I said, I wanted to use Echo Plate 2. Uh, right, we're sending to Echo Plate 2. And I don't want to hear, I just want to hear the returns. I don't want to hear anything else. And then I want to jazz around with the returns. And I said, right, have you got the 4K up? I said, yes, he's got the 4K up. And I said, I don't want to hear as much as that. And we pulled it back and back and back until we had what I call the magic. And that record then said it all. That was a great song, man. It, it, a great, great, great song. But it was you huge. Think it, you know that when, when you've got this, big stuff that happens and the orchestra are happening and everything like that. Believe it or not, that little bit of fairy dust that I added, when it came back, it actually meant twice as much. Right. It, 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 you know, it wasn't doing it initially. But what could I do in the amount of time I had? And I had to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And that was my rabbit. And, you know, it, it kind of jumped right out of the speakers. Jumped right out of the speakers. I couldn't believe how, and even Ian, who was a genius of a cutting engineer, said, I didn't believe we could do that. And I said, now you, now you got it. He said, yeah. I, he said, that's, yeah. 
So what we did is we mastered it with the Echo, and then I did a tape copy um, with the Echo, and that that became the new master. So there's a, a master that is flat, and there's a master that has got the magic, um, and, and they're both in um, phonogram store cupboard. And I'm sure the record That's, company was I, happy as hell. Oh, sure they were. But you know something, you know, it, as I said, in, in when I was working, you kind of made it up as you went along, and you'd have to dig deep for, you know, answers. Uh, and I believe that that was that was an answer, you right? Know, that, that, that you know, I, there was no more I could do. Uh, I think even with Rick Van Dam, there was something that I was missing. And I said to him, I know what's missing with this, and it, it's got no pace. And um, I added something to the mark because the master was, was great. And again, I added something to that, um, which actually we lost um, one generation of copying, but it added so much to it that you think, well, you know, it's chalk and cheese, and yet it was missing. And, and it, was, it, was, it didn't have any pace. Um, so I added a, a floor tom-tom and a tambourine. And suddenly, it, it was all great. It's just those so little things. Still, was, those little, little things. The little things. You think, oh, do, you, do you get that? And they went, yeah. We don't understand why it's so different. I said, well, it's actually knowing. It's a bit like cooking, a, making a, a, a meal and saying, you know, it, it's nice, but you add a bit of salt or a little bit of pepper. Right. And, it, you know, it suddenly... It's alive. Right, of course. I, I think that, that that's, that's the trick, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you did, uh, on, I, on, honestly, I'm not lying when I say that I still listen to these songs today. The Sweet's been one of my all-time favorite bands my whole life. And I've right. always seen, you know, back when you're a kid, you get records, you read everything on it. So I've seen yeah. your name yeah. since I was like 10. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you. It's what influenced yeah. me. Those are the songs that influenced me. And I know. I, 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 oh, go on. I was, I was really ill about um, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and um, my, uh, this is a, a personal story. Uh, and um, I, uh, my, my youngest daughter, um, she booked me um, uh, in, in, into a, a lady that kind of um, read, reads palms and tells you about your future, and, you know. So, uh, and I went in, and believe me, I didn't really want to go, um, and I wouldn't have booked it for myself. But she she booked it, and and, and in the end, I'm pleased that I went. And she, you know, she like would connect me with with. Uh, with people that are passed over, in particular my mother, but the, the, the lady said to me, she's walking around with her, with my watch in her hand, and she said to me, are you a religious man? And I said, no. Um, uh, uh, because um, you've got a lot of friends on, the, on this side. I said, okay. She said, but you've got a following. And I actually didn't, I didn't get it. Because you've got a congregation. You've got a following. And, you know, it's only in the last year or two, doing interviews with people like yourself, that, that's what she was talking about. Wow, that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? That, for me, and, you know, the penny dropped 18 months ago. When I was thinking about what she said to me, following, following, why are people following me? And you, you know, you you just established that that and and, and there are lots of people, and I talk to many people um, and, and do lots of interviews, and I enjoy them um, that say similar things. I I am more than flattered, um, but that's what she meant, and I kind of get it and. I, it makes me enjoy it even more. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, 
you know, when you were growing up, you would read all the liner notes and you want to know who Absolutely. wrote the songs, who I produced. Knew every musician that played on Simon and Garfunkel's albums, I knew every musician that, that played on the Beatles, all, you know, what George Martin did, all the songs, every line. I actually went to school on, um, on those two artists in particular, uh, and I used to play them through my headphones in my little flat, and I used to play them at 75. I used to play the albums at 75, 45, 33, and backwards, and I, could, I worked out what they were doing. You think, oh, wow, it's a backwards echo. And it, and it goes, and you, and you go, right, okay, right. that's great. You know, you hear all these sort of things going on. And I worked out absolutely what was going on and how they got to where they, 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 they got to. And, uh, you know, I spent, I've spent two lunches with George Martin. And he became not a close friend, but, but a working colleague. And he used to come to the studio and he would cut um, albums with Paul McCartney um, and... Um, but his manager uh, and, and, and I uh, uh, were good friends. He's, unfortunately, he's passed on now. And he said, look, I want to get you together with George. He said, because George has had all these hits. And he said, I'd like him to meet you because you're an example of a kid that came up the hard way and has done what you've done. And he wanted me to give George a tour of Utopia. Okay, so it's not just the studio because it became a property company and the whole estate um, became Utopia Village. So he wanted to show George what sort of person I was and, and that I was independent and that um, I did as well as I did being independent and unfortunately, George didn't because he was working for EMI. And he wanted us to talk. And, you know, I, I was sat with my idol. And this man, who's a, an absolute genius. <laughs> right, yes. And, you know, I, I couldn't get a word in. I want, there were a million questions I wanted to ask this man. A million and he never gave me a chance because he was interviewing me. He really? wanted to know. He wanted to know everything, and that's the sort of person he was. He was. He was just. He was uh, the best school teacher a man could have had. He was just wonderful. Wow. And you know, when I, when I did ask him something, you know, he it was no bullshit. It was kind of like right to the point. He explained that, but I never really got to ask him. You know, I never went down on my list, and, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm upset that I didn't, he didn't give me a job. Right. Um, but, you know, because those those, those um, records that he made, um, they they shaped my career. Yeah. I, I went to school on his on his um, you know, production, but, and, and when I worked in Studio Two at Abbey Road, you know. I was in an environment that oh, you think is oh, well, this, this room's magical. It's a magical room. It's it, it's a box with a staircase that goes up to the control room. It was it was very very ordinary. It was, it was it had magic, you know. It was you know it wasn't you know a flash room by any means. Right. But you think about the stuff that came out of it, you know. Um, were, were, were magical. And then when he opened his own studio, because they opened their studio, um, uh, not the one in Oxford Circus, but the one in Hampstead, when they first opened it, I got a personal tour with George. He took me around and he showed me every room and he said he was telling me about the acoustics and how they had to change this and well, this didn't work and that didn't work. and You know, they had to spend so much extra money on it. Uh, and, you know, he was just an, an absolute, an absolute delight. He was, you know, as I say, he was my mentor. Right. Well, I've taken up a lot of your time, but I do want to ask one last question. 
Um, you got it. What are there any bands that you passed on that became like huge? Um, well, I did pass on Blondie. Did you really? Um, and that was well. That was because they fell out with Mike Chapman. Oh, okay. Um, right. So they were having problems, and Chris, whatever his name was from uh, Christmas, came over to see me, um, and said, "So we've got a problem, and um, with Mike Chapman and Blondie not getting on, and da 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 da. And would you, would you like to produce them?" I said. Okay, I, I, and he said, but you're going to have to go to New York. Now, that that was my stumbling block because um, I didn't want to spend four months in in New York away from my family. I said, is there any chance they'd like to come to London and work at Utopia with me? I'm at home here and I've got my staff and all, you know, uh, and uh, it, it would work really well. And he said, no, they won't do that. So I said, unfortunately, I've got to pass. And that was that was that was it. So um, I don't know what, what the outcome was, but um, yeah, that that was probably the biggest thing I actually um, I, I turned down. Yeah, um, she's still playing too. That, I know she is. I know she is. Um, I would have enjoyed that, but you know, when you hear some of the new artists and you think, "Oh my word, would I like to work with you?" Um, you know, there, there, there were a few. There were a few, there's a, a few acts out there. You think, you know, I, I, I want, I'd love to work with you. I know I could make a contribution. Right. And I think that that when you know that, um, you hear a record that is so good, you think, okay, the team have got that one right. And that's how I feel about Adele. Adele, she yeah, she's amazing. Make a bad record. Yeah. Yeah, I love would Adele. Would I? Would Would I work with Adele? Would I make a better record than they make? Probably not. Probably not. But then you hear um, a, a couple of Ed Sheeran things, and you think, if I worked with him, or even if I worked with uh, uh, Lewis Capaldi, could I make a contribution? Uh, Lewis Capaldi, I would love to work with, because I know I would make a huge contribution. Um, it, it's people like that where you feel I know I can take you to the next level, or maybe even the, and and grow and grow with you. Right. Uh, that is that's a that's that's you know that's because I would kind of like say, okay, I love where you are now. Um, and this is where we go next, but that's where we go in the future. Uh, that. As I say, my, my crystal ball, and um, I, I, I can see where these artists are, where they should be, and where they could be. And you think, oh my word, if 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 I can get them there, then you know I would have feel that I've, if you like, delivered. I've I've not made a promise I couldn't meet. And, you know, because um, I know that he's a really terrific writer and they're messing with him. They're trying, I mean, and it's actually coming from America. They're, they are putting in with people that he doesn't need to be with. Um, he's, a, he's a talent in his own right. And all he needs to be, he needs confidence. He needs comfort. Um and he needs somebody that he can just say, so what do you think? And I just think that, you know, doesn't want a yes man, you know, because his songs are really, really good. You know, you, if, if, if somebody like that turned up on my doorstep, that's, that's the act that I think I would brush off the cobwebs for. Well, I hope and maybe there could be a full circle and maybe work with Andy one more time. Um, I thought about it. Do you know, I it's the songs. Andy doesn't need to work with me. Andy is experienced enough to work and, and, and you know to drive his own career. But he's it's the songs that you know right. they, they fall short. They fall short. And 
you know, uh, difficult to tell somebody that, you know. Yeah, um, no, correct. I'm, I understand. Yeah, very but difficult. You, you never know the future. Maybe you guys will get together, no, sit don't. down. But, you, you know, the thing is, uh, I think that rather than work with somebody I've worked with before, I would much rather work with a, a, a youngster that actually needs me. Right. Because I, 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 Andy doesn't need me, you know. Andy needs to write great songs. He writes, he writes good songs. He doesn't write great songs, you know. And I think that... Um, you know the the, the, the Lewis Capaldi of the of this world write great songs, but they don't know they write great songs, or they overwrite. There's too much. You've given me too much. We could simplify it. Don't give me this. Don't give me that. Right. I want this and this and this. You know, and that that's that's the important thing. And, you know, I can sort youngsters out. I, I you know that's and that then I get a bug. If I if I turn back, I, you know it. It doesn't excite me. I, I need to go forward. And, and, and if I can't go forward, do you know what? I'm enjoying my retirement. Well, I'm going to keep a lookout. And you stay in touch okay. with me because if you do work on something, I want to hear it. I want to be one of the first to hear it. <laughs> okay. okay. Phil, thank yeah, you. Pleasure. Thank you so much for taking this time out because, honestly, it means the world to me. I hope I haven't bought I hope I haven't bored you, and I hope I haven't bored your listeners. Not at all. I have waited a lifetime to talk to you. Well, you know, I, I, you know if there's feedback, I'd like to know about it. Oh, definitely. I'm going to, yeah. when I post the interview, I'll make sure that all the sweet fans know, and um, okay. we'll stay in touch. And, you know, I just want to thank them for the years of support because, you know, hey, those old days were, were amazing. They, they, you know, and um, we were riding on a, a white charger. And the trick is, when it comes to work charging, it's staying on. Right. You know, and lots of people fall off. That's true. Thank you so much again. I I appreciate this so much. A pleasure. Good to talk to you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, the interview with Phil Wayman on the Rock and Roll Station podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, like, tell your friends. Until next time, 